Our last speaker for today is going to be Nicole Morlika, who's a senior researcher at Microsoft Research. So it's a bit of a, a home play for you, I guess, in some ways. Um, <laughs> Nicole has a, a very, very interesting, very impressive track record. So she did her PhD at MIT, and before joining Microsoft Research, she was an assistant professor at Northwestern. Um, she's also, as a, as a young researcher myself, she has this really uh, enviable record. She has more than 70 uh, published articles. Um, that's a bit scary to look at. <laughs> that's because I'm from computer science. <laughs> right, uh, fair enough, it's, it's, a, it's a large one. But, uh, and also, she, she uh, wrote an article called Why I Don't Rob Banks for a Living, which I think uh, any, anyone should, have, should really write that article, right? Um, and today, yeah, she will tell us a bit about quadratic voting. So, Nicole, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Nicole and Marlika, and I'm going to talk about quadratic voting, which is uh, so. This session is about uh, collect the collective, and uh, one thing that's very important in communities is to make collective decisions. And how do we come about collective decisions that are good for the community as a whole? Um, I think this is a really uh, important issue in our society, uh, particularly in these times. Uh, this is the cover, I'm sure many of you recognize it, that Idel Rodriguez uh, had on Time Magazine uh, of Trump. And I just bring this up to point out that like, uh, we have a lot of divisiveness in our society today about our leadership and our politics. And I think that in part this is driven by, as some of you have raised, the poor systems of elections that uh, we uh, engage in in this country. Um, so I'm gonna present quadratic voting in the view of political elections, but I would like to say that of course these are incredibly high stake decisions and I wouldn't advocate jumping to this uh, system that I'm going to present in the context of political elections immediately. I think that there should be some sort of test beds for it first. And in fact, um, as Glenn pointed out to me uh, a few days or two ago, the government of Taiwan is going to use quadratic voting to determine the uh, winner of its presidential hackathon. Um, so this is maybe a more comfortable space in which to think about these ideas, although I'll continue, continue to use the political analogy. So the question that I think, you know, looking at it from an axiomatic point of view, as you suggested, uh, one thing you might want to ask is, can we design voting rules which elect highly valued candidates? Like, uh, is there a voting system which is going to create uh, outcome in equilibrium in which the welfare optimal candidate wins the election. And one thing that I think uh, ties to the previous talks, especially uh, Zoe mentioned that uh, majority rule is not that system. It's easy to see that majority rule might create uh, an outcome in which uh, the favored candidate, the one that produces the most value to society, actually loses. So here you can imagine an example in which you have a population of voters and there's a minority of voters that prefer the donkey to the elephant. And these people feel very strongly. Uh, whereas there's a majority of, uh, can of voters that are pretty much indifferent between the donkey and the elephant and have a slight preference for the elephant. Uh, and so now if you have a majority rule system in which you have one person, one vote, then clearly the elephant is going to win the election. Um, so in order to, uh, and this is despite the fact that the uh, welfare maximizing candidate, you can certainly set up the utilities of the voters for the candidate such that the welfare maximizing candidate in this example would be the donkey. Uh, so I, the quadratic voting scheme was introduced to address this concern. Um, it's based on ideas that have been around for many decades. Penrose uh, is the sort of originator, and although many other people have thought about these things as well. But um, the idea here is that the problem with majority voting is that voting, uh, you just spend, every person gets one vote. But in fact, we want the votes to be sensitive to your utility function and to your, the strength of your preference between the options. And therefore, we need to make votes costly. Uh, 
And in fact, in order to uh, set up the right equations, we need the votes to be proportional, the price of V votes to be uh, proportional to the square of V votes. So you want to, if you want to buy 10 votes for a candidate, you need to pay $100. Um, and this has uh, the, and then you know, how do you decide who the winner is once you've collected all the votes? You do something uh, perhaps uh, like a soft max. So you elect an alternative with some probability that's increasing in the uh, vote total that that alternative received in the election. And so in this example here, what you can see is that the people that are basically indifferent aren't going to spend all that much money on votes because if the outcome flips, it doesn't really impact their utility all that much. And here I'm assuming quasi-linear utilities. Uh, whereas the people who have a really strong preference for the donkey are going to be willing to buy votes. And so in this quadratic election, the donkey will win. And that is the welfare maximizing alternative. So this rationale leads us to understand that quadratic voting is going to end up electing the alternative that maximizes the value to society. Um, and there's a very simple reasoning for a mathematical reasoning for why we expect that outcome. The reasoning is that, uh, well, what are you going to do if you're a voter facing this system? How are you going to act? Well, well you, you, you have you know, your utility function, which is your value for the uh, outcome that you prefer minus the cost you had to spend to vote in the election. And so that's what you want to maximize. You're going to choose a number of votes to buy. The votes that, that that choice is going to impact both the probability that that alternative is elected and the cost that you have to spend in the election. So you're going to choose the number of votes to buy to maximize this function. And as I mentioned, the uh, outcome is going to be some function of all the vote totals in the society. And the cost to you personally is the number of votes you bought squared, because that's the rule for quadratic voting. So how do we maximize, uh, you know, simple optimization theory says that we take the derivative and we set it equal to zero. And so now what you can see is that when I do that calculation, uh, the quadratic form has this very nice property that the derivative is linear. And hence, the votes are going to be proportional to the value that the agent has for the outcome when they're uh, acting in equilibrium. And uh, of course, this function here has some impact on the derivative too, and in large markets, we argue that that is basically constant uh, or the same across voters. And so what happens is everybody's buying a number of votes that's proportional to their value for their favorite outcome, and hence, when we sum up all the votes, we get this result that the uh, guy with the highest number of votes, the alternative with the highest number of votes, is the one that was the most valued. In fact, the t number of votes that the alternative receives is proportional to the value that that alternative uh, gives to the society. Um, and so the quadratic rule measures the value of the outcome. It measures strength of preferences. Now, this is a, a really interesting idea. Um, but as you notice, I presented this in the context of two alternatives. But many elections that we might want to run have multiple alternatives. Uh, and so there's a question of how to generalize this setup to multiple alternatives. And uh, we show how to do this uh, in our joint work. And what we uh, show is that like, you, know, you can imagine many ways to generalize the rule. It turns out the right one, and I'm not going to go into why, is to uh, let agents buy votes both for and against different alternatives. So here, the agent might love the cat, is indifferent to dogs, and hates mice then uh, the agent might want to buy votes for cats uh, and against mice. And the cost of five votes for cats is $25. And the cost of three votes against mice is $9. And maybe for equilibrium reasons, you might want to vote a little bit for the dog. And so you can see how this is generalizing to multiple candidates. Um, and the result, again, generalizes that in a setting with multiple candidates or multiple alternatives, the vote total ends up ranking the alternatives by social value, implying that, again, the best alternative wins. But OK, so this is sort of the basic ideas in quadratic voting. Uh, what I want to discuss in the rest of the talk is objections uh, 
we might have to actually implementing this in uh, our own elections. One is uh, that it, this, uh, as I mentioned, is going to require large societies. Um, so we're looking at everything in large limits. I, I'm not gonna go into that much. I think that as was mentioned in earlier talks, in small societies, governance isn't uh, as much of an issue. This really becomes problematic in large societies. So this is exactly the setting in which we need a solution like this to solve the problem. Um, the second uh, issue that you might take with quadratic voting as a, a solution is that it has a really strong assumption of fair elections. So uh, what I mean by this is that quadratic voting is particularly susceptible to collusion. Why is that? Well, think about the voting rule I said. It's, it's quadratic. So if uh, one person has $100, uh, they can only buy 10 votes with that $100 because of the quadratic rule. But if 100 people each have $1, they can buy 100 votes with their $1 because of the quadratic rule. So it really encourages me to try and form voting groups which are going to uh, collectively uh, you know, um, vote together and thereby I can really make my dollar go a lot farther if I have a lot of different individuals voting. So I need to make sure that each person votes exactly once. I mean, one way you could implement this without even trying to convince your friends to vote the way that you're voting is to just to create many fake identities. And then if I create 100 fake identities, my $100 can get me 100 votes instead of 10 votes. So I think uh, you know, quadratic voting, like many of the ideas in this conference, needs to be developed in conjunction with other uh, ideas. And in this case, something that will help fair elections is a notion of identity. And so uh, we've also been working on uh, decentralized identity. And I just want to briefly mention our ideas. Um, which is that you know you could imagine uh, identity or voter fraud being prevented by I have to give a driver's license in order to vote or something like that. Uh, but another system which is not centrally controlled and therefore can't be uh, co-opted by the government to disenfranchise people would be a decentralized system in which uh, individuals are, are identified by their personal attributes and this would be things like my mother's maiden name, my city of birth, maybe very personal information like the location of my first kiss. And these bits of data about me constitute my identity. And they are decentralized, they're distributed in my social network. Everybody, all of my friends, each know one of these pieces of my identity or multiple subsets of my identity. But no single individual knows everything there is to know about me. And so these decentralized uh, bits of information live in a massive social network. And in each link on this network, uh, there's some amount of trust. So this is like, you know, how much this individual trusts this individual is the weight of that edge. And now in order to uh, determine someone's identity, if I, as person A, want to claim to person B that I, say, have this diamond attribute, I can, uh, person B can search through the social network to verify that in fact I have that diamond attribute. And using such, uh, such claims, I can prove <laughs> that I am in fact person A. And that would enable voting without centralized identity schemes. Another issue with this uh, decentralized, with, with uh, quadratic voting that might bother you is the assumption of quasi-linear utilities. In particular, I talked about buying in votes. And I think this makes a lot of people uncomfortable because we don't like to think about running elections where people have to pay to vote. Um, and so instead, a uh, very natural thing you might think to do to circumvent that is to allocate points. Uh, of course, in the two alternative setting, giving people points to vote is just reduces the system to a majority rule because there's no value for the leftover points, so I'm just going to put all my points on the favorite candidate. But if you have multiple candidates, then uh, these points force you to make trade-offs between your candidates. And so uh, th then you can extend the quadratic voting setting to um, a setting where we don't necessarily assume quasi-linear utility. Of course, this raises a very big issue, which is 
how many points should I allocate per voter? And um, we've also been looking into that. I think I will skip this in the uh, interests of time. But you, know, you might want to allocate the same number of points to every voter. That would be a reasonable idea. But then people who, uh, on most issues, are kind of at the uh, societal uh, like, you know, norm, like they're pretty normal on most issues, will have a lot of power on the few issues that they care about. Whereas people that are extreme on all the issues will uh, have very little power overall. And so we've been investigating ways to equalize the power across the society, which I will skip. Um, and the final uh, thing that I think should really be uh, of concern to us is I proved these theorems in the equilibrium, right? Like if everybody is playing their equilibrium strategy, then the uh, most valued alternative wins the election. But what leads us to believe people would play the equilibrium in these systems? This is, uh, you know, requires people to understand quadratic formulas and optimized quadratic, func you know, convex functions. Uh, are people really capable of doing this? And I think the answer is it really depends on what questions you ask them. So we often think about designing mechanisms as setting up mathematical rules and then assuming rational behavior, and voila, we get some outcome. But there's this whole other step in the design process that is quite often overlooked, which is what is the interface with which the people interact with the mechanism I've set up? And so um, this is just sort of a, a you know, gra graphic I made for how you might try to uh, set up a quadratic voting system. You can imagine that you have your phone and you're voting for your candidates and you can drag, you know, your votes to be more negative or more positive and it will uh, reflect in your budget accordingly. Um, so this, this will help you understand your own costs and then you would need some sort of system to help you reach an equilibrium, maybe through an iterated uh, process of uh, people, you know, the, the system is open for voting for a while and people can make adjustments. Um, so in summary, I've uh, talked about quadratic voting, I told you that the most valued alternative wins, uh, it requires uh, fair elections, which is, uh, requires some sort of a robust identity solution, and I think uh, we have some interesting ideas about a robust decentralized identity solution. Again, I think the decentralization is important to prevent the disenfranchisement of voters. Uh, and you also uh, need to potentially, for some applications, eliminate the payments uh, that we assume in the quasi-linear setup, and you can do that using script. Uh, and then, as my last slide suggested, uh, we need to think about uh, user interface design that will enable people to play the equilibrium in these settings. Um, and so there's some thoughts that Glenn has a company working on this. Thanks. Thank you, Nicole. Do we have any, any questions before we'll let Glenn make some final remarks? Hi everyone, I'm from Hong Kong. I thought that was a fantastic panel, well worth my 16 hour flight. <laughs> um, I'm actually a practitioner in public finance and also in financial policy. I don't know how many of us are here in this room. So I just wanted to share some of my observations on when you're really, um, when you're really breathing and living like public finance and financial policy, what are some of the key things that I'm observing in my day to day work? Uh, the first one I would say is that when the, the theme of this panel was actually community. So what do we mean by community? And there are several ways of looking at this. The first way is very um, quite basic, which is looking at the different levels, so the local level, the national level, and the international level. And when we're form formulating policy um, in financial policy, for example, in fintech and cryptocurrencies, we're really looking at all three levels. And I think this is something to bear in mind. Uh, especially because with technology revolutionizing how financial services operates. So the international cooperation dimension across countries and jurisdictions with very different political systems 
I think this is something that is going to get even even more important. The second way to look at it, I guess, would be um, at networks. So my professor at Princeton, Anne Marie Slaughter, she wrote a book on a new world order um, many years ago, and I'm actually experiencing it myself these days because um, I do find that as government officials, we have. Um, networks with government officials in other countries. Judges in Hong Kong, for example, we are, our judicial system is independent of that of China. We have 14 world-renowned judges from other common law jurisdictions sitting on our court of final appeal. So that's an example of, um, of judges learning from each other and sitting on different jurisdictions. And the third one, which is very timely, I don't know whether you guys uh, saw the news that we just um, we just announced the blueprint for the Greater Bay Area, and I think this comes to um, the point where geography matters when we're thinking about public policy and public finance. A lot of times, it's not just at the city level. There are there's the San Francisco Bay Area, there's the Tokyo Bay Area, there's the New York Bay Area, and the Greater Bay Area that we just proposed in we just unveiled in Hong Kong actually comprises of nine cities in Guangdong province, as well as Hong Kong and also Macau. So there are some people who have suggested, can we have a sandbox for FinTech for the Greater Bay Area instead of just for um, a particular city? And others have suggested that when we're collecting economic statistics, should we have economic statistics for the entire Bay Area instead of just a particular city? Um, and even I found the uh, discussion of matching funds to be quite fascinating as well. Could we have a matching fund for a Bay Area instead of uh, a, uh, a more traditional political unit? So uh, I just wanted to share some of my observations, and I thought it was a fantastic presentation. Thank you, and congratulations. Yeah, I think uh, I also have to say that I've learned an awful lot today. So I think we should all give a big round of applause, everybody. <laughs> Also, these ladies here to the panelists and Glenn, I think you have a few last words. No, I'll let Paul do that. All right, thank you.